Hey, good morning, everybody. It's Robbie Berg again, a hurricane specialist here at the National Hurricane Center. Uh, we're back in the Hurricane Specialist Unit Operations Area, and we've got a special guest with us this week, uh, Dr. Neil Jacobs, uh, the Deputy Administrator for NOAA, has been with us all week, and uh, we have an opportunity to talk with him now. Uh, Neil, uh, welcome to the Hurricane Center. Uh, one of the priorities that you've stated in this new position is about improving the modeling that we use, not just in tropical meteorology, but modeling in general. Uh, but let's talk specifically about the models that we use here uh, in the tropics. Uh, what you're looking at is actually the GS, GFS, the uh, United States uh, global model that we use to predict weather across the globe. Uh, we're looking at specifically here off the Pacific coast of Mexico is uh, the GFS spinning up a potential tropical cyclone as we get out towards next week. So when you're looking at a model like the GFS, what is it that about the GFS, uh, how well it does now, and what is it that we need to improve on it? Well, there, there's a lot of things that we're going to be working on in, in, the, in the global model. The, the first one is the dynamic core. So we're going to be switching from the, the original spectral-based dynamic core to a gridded dynamic core called a finite volume cube, or FB3. We're going to be running that in parallel to the current spectral model this year and eventually transition that over to the operational deterministic model. So for the layman, what does that all, that all mean going from spectral to... It, it, it allows us, so a gridded model actually calculates the equations on a grid and it allows us to get to a much higher resolution. So eventually we'll be running a, a global model that can resolve actual thunderstorm convection. Right, so again, this is the global model. This is run across the entire Earth, so it's not just focused specifically on the tropics, but we do use it for determining if a cyclone is going to form, uh, how strong it might get, where it might go. But there's other models within NOAA's arsenal that we use to actually predict tropical cyclones. Could you discuss a little bit about those? Sure. So we've got, in addition to the global deterministic model, we've got a global ensemble, which is several different models of, of the global scale that we sort of look to quantify the, the spread and, and uncertainty in the forecast. And then we also have limited area models. Uh, like the wharf, or we have the, the rapid refresh, the high resolution rapid refresh of the HER, and then the H wharf and the H wharf basin, which run out uh, their limited area models, but they're much higher resolution. And so we need a, a really accurate global model to predict the boundary conditions for the limited area models. And the limited area models actually have the capability of following the individual storms around and doing the, the, the calculations and forecasts of the intensity of the, the, the center of the core of the storm. Right. So, yes, I think here at the Hurricane Center, we're pretty excited about the advancements that we'll probably have coming up in the future. Uh, you know, we're always wanting to make better forecasts, obviously, and it all comes back to the actual models that we use. So the last thing I want to talk about, Neil, is that you're actually a Miami native, isn't that correct? That's yes. right. I, I grew up in South Miami Heights. So what kind of storms are you used to in your past? Uh, so there was, there was, you know, there's a lot of hurricanes that, that, that we lived through when I lived in Miami, but we actually moved away from Miami before Andrew, but we moved to Charleston, South Carolina, right before Hurricane Hugo hit. And one of the things that I didn't really think about when I lived in Miami was how many trees coastal South Carolina has. We had 14 trees go down in our yard and two went through our house. And we thought, you know, being, you know, hardened, Miami natives that, that, you know, had endured a lot of hurricanes that we would be fine and we stayed there during Hugo and there was a, 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 about a 20 some odd foot storm surge plus a lot of tree damage from the wind and I remember waking up the next day um, and having to chainsaw out of my neighborhood just to try to, to drive away to find gas and so you know one of the messages that we're trying to convey to people here today is, is be prepared you know, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And and it's it's a lot of things that, that you really don't think about. Like if you don't have power, the, the gas stations can't pump gas. You, you need gas, you need food, you need water. All of these things be prepared in advance. And then lastly, I think one of the things about your meteorological background is that you're actually a surfer as well. I am. I am. I actually, so I, I came from applied math and physics in the semiconductor industry and switched over and did a PhD in numerical weather prediction solely because I was actually forecasting to know when the winds and the waves would be the best and then realized if I'm doing this for fun I might as well get a job and get paid to do it. Uh, so my entire background in weather forecasting is, is based in, in surfing and, and forecasting seas as well. Yeah, I, I gotta admit I think some of the best marine forecasters have to be the surfers. We have several people here who are surfers and uh, they definitely have, or they're in tune with what's going on with the ocean. So uh, I think uh, you're probably in that same book. So. 
So thanks, Neil, for joining us uh, this week. It's been a pleasure having you here, and uh, thanks for joining us here on this Facebook Live session. Sure. Thanks for having me.